Good morning, class. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and this is Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, my faith grows stronger, and I learn how to be an overcomer. We say that because uh, we immediately get our words working on this happening and not wait till halfway through the class. We believe it's happening right now. The scripture said, let the weak say what? I am strong, so no matter how weak you feel or how much of a lack of knowledge you're experiencing, it doesn't pay to talk how you feel. Faith calls even those things that be not as though they were. So we call ourselves strong, we call ourselves bright, we call ourselves growing, we call ourselves overcomers, victorious ones. Get your Bible and something to make a note with. Come on into the class with us. We've saved you a seat right up here in the front. Let's pray, release faith that we will receive exactly what, uh, not just what you think or what I think, but what the Lord knows that we need for today. We ask it, Father. In Jesus' name, we ask for the anointing that teaches, reveals, and helps. We ask for the quickening of your Holy Spirit. We ask for answers. Uh, help us to see things we haven't seen before and to understand things and to uh, see how to put it into practice and be those that do live by faith and walk by faith and overcome by faith, those that please you well in this life and in all things and accomplish your will and purposes. We ask for it. We make ourselves available. We present ourselves to you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Look in um, Hebrews, please, the 10th chapter, and let's continue in our study of, that we're calling By Faith. In our text, we see here in the 10th chapter, in the 35th verse of Hebrews, it says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. It has great recompense of reward. You have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. We said confidence is another word for faith. It's actually used in the definition of faith. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, in the Young's literal translation, it says faith is of things hoped for, a confidence. But confidence in what? In who? Our confidence is not just in ourself and in our knowledge and abilities. Our confidence, and, and let me say this too, your confidence should not be over much in the knowledge of men. Uh, remember, uh, you hear some people say, well, I, I don't go for all that, you know, mystical, spiritual stuff. I'm a man of science. I'm a man of, uh, or somebody says, I'm a woman of education and, 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 you know, I'm a person of science. Remember who wrote those books? People like you <laughs> with imperfect knowledge. The, the cutting edge scientist three, four, five hundred years ago, much of what they were sure of has been proven wrong. Well, if the world stands, what about another 200 years from now? Huh? I mean, just in the last 20, 30 years, I've seen book after book written about things that this was a cure for this, this was an answer for this, this was, and come to find out that's not right. They found out in 20 years it wasn't right. Found out in 30, 40 years it wasn't right. Remember when you are reading after or listening to something that another human being, imperfect in knowledge, just like yourself, wrote. Do not make it an infallible standard when it is not. But if God is real, and if the Bible is his inspired word, it is an infallible standard. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it is. 
And the person that said they found errors and mistakes in it does not know what they're talking about. They just found some things they didn't understand. There's been numerous times I've seen things in the Bible and the Word that didn't seem to agree. I didn't quite understand it. But sometimes 10 years later, the Lord showed me and I go, oh, <laughs> oh, it agrees perfectly. It's just imperfect in knowledge. But this is perfect. I didn't say every translation of it is perfect, but the original word is perfect. Perfect. And we see in this 11th chapter of Hebrews that he's talking about people who had faith in a perfect God and his perfect word. And he mentions individuals. All through these verses, when we get down to verse 32, he mentions six individuals in the same verse, and one of them is Samson. We've been studying Samson this week. Back in Judges uh, 13 and 14. Now if you want to turn back there and look again. But when Samson is mentioned in Hebrews 11.32. Why, what's he mentioned for? Why is he there? Because of his faith. His faith. Uh, I think people tend to think of Samson as just being a real strong guy. And not necessarily a, a man of great faith. But. You don't get in Hebrews 11 <laughs> and, and not have faith. He's mentioned because of his faith. In uh, Judges 13, we saw that before his birth, the angel appeared and spoke to his mother and gave her very specific instructions that he was to be a Nazarite. Not, not Nazarene. We talked about that. That's not the same thing. One separated to God. And he was to be separated God, to God, not just for a temporary uh, period of time, from his birth to his death. He was to be separated to God. You could say it like this. He had a call on his life. He had a call on his life, a divine destiny. God intended to use him. He had already told his parents before he was born what for. God intended to use him to raise him up as a champion, as a hero, as a deliverer to, to get his people out from under the thumb and the oppression of the Philistine forces. And as such, he was to have these signs of his separation. Now, we're going to talk about that further as we go, but why, why, would you, why, why would you have signs of separation? Well, because God should get the glory, hmm? not, not the instrument. What could Samson do without the anointing of God? Nothing. And so these Philistines and these other ungodly nations and groups around them they don't even believe in God. They don't, uh, not necessarily, or they certainly not enough to serve him or worship him. And um, so it, the plan is not for them just to be impressed with this individual Samson. I mean, uh, back in those days, they could wind up trying to worship him or something. They, they, they thought he was some huge thing. No, it was the God who's using him. It was the God who heard the prayers of his people. That God is delivering his people and is using this man. And this separation of his not cutting his hair and of him being separated from certain things and diet and drink and that kind of thing, that's an outward sign that he is a vessel of God and for God to get to glory. And that's why it's, it's something not to be trifled with, this separation and the signs of this separation are, are not to be uh, treated lightly. Now, we see that when he was born in 13, 24, and 25, uh, the child grew, the Lord blessed him. The Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshdel. We we compared this to what happened with David when he was a boy out with the flocks 
and how that the Spirit of God came on him and he, uh, he, he protected the flock from a, a bear and from a lion and, and had found courage and confidence and ability. And then when it was time for him, even as a youth, to face Goliath, he, he used that confidence that he got from that victory with the lion and with the bear. And he had full confidence to face Goliath, uh, the Philistine giant. And so we see here that uh, this kind of thing is coming up in uh, Samson's life, but he's experiencing it even as a youth, even as a boy. Now in the 14th chapter, uh, we're, we're going to look at the circumstances of this a little bit later, but verse 5 says, Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnath, and he came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. Now, in those days, uh, it's still this, this way today in, in places, but especially then, not nearly as much development and infrastructure, wild beasts were a problem. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, in many places, you could be in danger just leaving the house. Well, they encountered a lion uh, and a young lion. And verse 6, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily on him, on Samson, and he rent him, he tore him, as he would have rent a kid, a baby goat. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. This is amazing, isn't it? The, um, the complete Jewish Bible says it like this, the Spirit of Adonai came powerfully upon Samson and barehanded, he tore the lion to pieces. <laughs> this is something. <laughs> now, don't try this at home. <laughs> you don't go hand to hand with a lion. <laughs> and yet, uh, like, like we said yesterday, you know, people read this and they scoff and they mock and they go, oh, that's ridiculous. That's, that's a myth. That's a fantasy. It's a tale. Uh, if it is, you should get up and leave this class right now. And you, and you, sh you don't need to keep this book anymore either. Amen. You understand? Yes. No. Because if that's a myth, then I reckon the virgin birth is a myth and the literal physical resurrection of Jesus is a myth and creation account is a myth. And there's people that, that believe that. They say they believe that. And it's sad that they do. Because as long as they believe that lie, the, you know, the, the psalmist said, the fool has said, there is no God. God calls people fools that deny his existence. And it is sad what your existence will be like uh, without God. And the fear of death. You cannot get free from the fear of impending death your whole life long. You're subject to bondage. No, no. If part of this is true, all of it's true. <laughs> and it is true. It is the infallible, living Word of God. Perfect Word of God. So this happened just exactly like you read it. This lion thought he had found lunch. <laughs> and normally that would have been the case. He would have jumped on this man and ripped him apart and ate him. And it wouldn't be nothing to write about. <laughs> but when this lion jumped on Samson, tell me what happened next. Class, what happened next? Didn't you say he ripped him apart? The Spirit of the Lord came on him. This is the difference. The Spirit of the Lord. Now see, this is something he's already had some experience. And even as a boy, he'd be doing things and the Spirit of the Lord would come on him. And I'm sure he'd feel like physically he could just do anything. He'd think, what? Is, glory to God. You know what? The, the, and he knew. And we, 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 we don't want to forget. He knew what this is. His parents told him from the time he was old enough to understand anything. The angel appeared said this, you're a vessel. He knew what it's for. It's for the deliverance of his people. He knew it. 
And so when he started to exert himself against the lion, that anointing came on him and, and there was so much power that he just ripped that, that beast apart. Now, many have imagined, and I guess they've made movies about Samson, you know, and they try to find big burly guys to play Samson, but we don't know that Samson was a big guy. I don't know of anything that would lead us to believe he was bigger than any other guy. He, he might have been a healthy specimen of a man, I don't, but he may have been average size because this is not based on his physical size. You could have been eight foot tall and not be able to do this, right? Or the things that happened later. Uh, hold your place here and look in Mark, the fifth chapter, Mark 5 and verse 1. Mark 5 and verse 1, and I'm reading the NIV. It says, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Again, we have no reason to think that this is a giant of a man. In fact, reading the rest of the passage, he lived out in the tombs, and he was out of his head, crazy, and he cut himself and lacerated himself with stone. Well, living like that, you're going to be emaciated. I mean, he loses blood doing all this stuff. This strength of breaking chains and shackles is not natural. It is spiritual. There are spiritual forces at work. And it was manifesting through this man, evil spirit. The, the very strength that we have in our natural physical body, able to stand, able to sit, able to walk, where does it come from? You know, people might examine and say, well, you know, your heart's beating and the flow of nerve energy and, and uh, uh, the twitching of muscle fibers and the contraction. Okay, but where does that force come from? That li the, what it comes down to in scientific study is life force. Okay, what is that? You can't see that. You can't put that under the microscope. What, what is that? And people say, well, you know, it's, it comes from the brain. It doesn't come from the brain. What, what power is firing the synapses in the brain? It comes from the core of your being, the spirit of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that, that spirit uh, that's alive came from the father of spirits. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who's also the father of life. Well, that's why you have some strength. It's, a, it's a, from a spiritual source. Well, uh, if it's spiritual in source, it could be enhanced. <laughs> it could be boosted by, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit. You know, if the Holy Spirit puts his life force on top of your life force, you got something, you got, you got a strong force. And even the enemy, obviously, is able to boost, you know, uh, human strength through spiritual influence. But again, this is not because Samson was some hawk of a man. And, and the reason why people do that is because they're only natural and they can only think natural. And so they think it had, he had to be biggest, strongest man in the world. No, like we said, if you're eight foot tall, you still can't rip lines apart like that. And you can't do the other things he did. This was not about his physical conditioning or the size of his body. Go back with me to Judges 13, 14. This, uh, let me say it like this, 1325 the Spirit of the Lord began to move him. 14.6, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. 
Does the Spirit of the Lord still come on people today? Yes, he does. I'm convinced he wants to come on more people, a lot more people of God's people, if we would learn how to yield to him. In all kinds of ways and places, he'll come on you and give you wisdom. He'll come on you and quicken your mind, help you to see answers. He'll come on you and you lay hands on people and healing can be ministered to them. He'll come on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that, that's what was, was happened on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of God came on them. There is the work of the Spirit within in the new birth. But that's not the end, it's the beginning. Then beyond that, there is the work of the Spirit upon, anointing us on us for service. And how much uh, anointing and how much service? Part of that lies with us. Part of it has to do with God's call and plan for our life, obviously. But part of it has to do with how much we're willing to separate ourselves to it. How much we're willing to give ourselves to him, which is what you see when Samson, he was supposed to be given to the Lord his whole life. That's the language language that was used for Samuel, that his mother said he was given to the Lord, and that was for his whole life. He, Samson, uh, Samuel, John the Baptist are three individuals that were given to the Lord, separated their whole life, not just a, a period of time. And we see the, the power of God and manifesting in them in amazing ways. They changed nations and they changed generations God did through them. We see here that... Uh, uh, and I'm I'm skipping ahead, but I'm I'm going to come back, that um, when they had this episode with uh, his wedding party, that um, the men tricked, you know, or pressured his wife and got the answer to the riddle. And verse 19 of chapter 14 says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them. One guy kills 30. And took their spoil. And then in the 15th chapter, after he had uh, burnt down the crops of the Philistines, uh, they came to get him. And um, his own people came to get him because they said, do you not realize that the Philistines control us? They're in power here. And he said, well, just tell me that you won't turn me over to them. And they said, we, uh, we, or you won't kill me. They said, no, we'll just tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. And he said, okay, he agreed to that. And the Bible said in verse 14, 15, 14, 15, 14, when, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. They thought, we got him. I mean, he's tied up and presented here in a package. And they shouted and, the, and what happened next? Read it. What, what happened there? The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Now, this is something you won't see the movies emphasize. <laughs> They'll emphasize Samson being big, being strong, maybe handsome. They'll emphasize Delilah. But they won't emphasize the big thing. This is the big thing. The Spirit of God came on him. Why? Because then you're going to talk about God. Now you're talking about God. The Spirit of God came on him. There is no story without that phrase. (laughs) Everybody see that and understand that? There, There is no story without that. Because that was the precursor for, for the miracle that happened next. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. Now that's amazing. I reckon you could have put a, a giant set of iron handcuffs and shackles on him, and when the Holy Ghost came on him, pop. 
just, just pop into pieces. <laughs> this is not because Samson's so amazing. This is because God is so amazing. And this anointing would come on him. Should we be interested in this anointing? Huh? Should we, the Bible said we, are to, we should covet earnestly the best gifts, talking about the manifestations and gifts of the Holy Spirit. We should hunger and thirst after the power of God, uh, seeking these anointings coming on, and not just for us individually. Uh, one individual is not going to have all these different anointings, but we want to see them in our midst. We want to see them in the church, Right? We just want to, yeah, we want to experience whatever we're supposed to experience in our life, but we want to see all the varied manifestations of the anointing throughout the church. Say, say it out loud, Lord, we hunger for them. We desire them. And so uh, uh, the, the bands just popped off of him, and he found a new jawbone of an ass. A donkey had died, just fresh uh, corpse. And he, he grabbed that jawbone and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, and Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jaw of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. <laughs> this is like a, a verse, uh, a poem verse, if you will. The NIV says, with a donkey's jawbone, I've made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I killed a thousand men. <laughs> How did it happen, class? How did it happen? The Spirit of the Lord. Where do we see uh, Samson's faith? He had faith in that anointing. He had faith in that power. Why would you grab a jawbone of a donkey and face off with a thousand men? Why would you do that? Because he had confidence. He had faith in that anointing coming on him that it would enable him to do anything. And he kept swinging and he kept swinging. And, and the scripture says he piled them up. Pi well, a thousand piled them up. And what's happening? God is delivering his people from the oppression of these Philistine ungodly folks. And that's all our time <laughs> for today. Say it out loud, I live by faith, I walk by faith, I overcome the world by faith, I'm strong in faith, giving glory to God. We'll see you next time in Faith School. I've got the victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.